This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Let's turn to God's word. Our first reading is from the book of Micah. It's found in our Pew Bibles on page 933, if you want to follow along. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 5a. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is led against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Amen. And since uh, our theme today is anticipation of Christ's coming, we're going to turn now to Matthew's Gospel and to chapter 1. Matthew is the first of the four Gospels, and we read from verse 1. A record of the genealogy, or another word for that is Genesis, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinabab, Abinabab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abja, Abja the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh. Manasseh the father of Ammon, Ammon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jonathan, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jonah was the father of Sheltiel, Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Binwood, Abinwood the father of Elikim, Elikim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Ulud, Ulud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathan, Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus there were fourteen generations in all from Abraham to David, fourteen from David to the exile to Babylon, and fourteen from the exile to the Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. We pray God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. Now, because it is near Christmas, I'll let you into a secret. 
If any of you were to participate in a how to construct a good sermon workshop, the first piece of advice which professors Bill Adley or Drew Gibson would likely give is this, start off with a good story. Begin with an attention grabber in order to make sure you grip the congregation's attention. Unfortunately, it would appear that the Apostle Matthew never had the good fortune of learning homiletics at Union Theological College. And instead of starting off his gospel with a good story, he begins with the genealogy. Now, I know that for some people, their idea of fun is indeed delving deeply into family history. But for others, let's face it, it is not high on their happy scale. So how come this good news apostle chooses, yes, chooses, to start his gospel by giving us a list of names, five of whom are women, all contained within these three paragraphs, each of which is composed of 14 generations. Except, you see, these opening words of Matthew's book would have grabbed the attention of the first Jewish hearers, because literally they heard the genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, This story which Matthew is about to tell concerning Jesus Messiah is how the ancestor of King David and the patriarch Abram is born in the city of David in order to bring about a brand new beginning, a new start, the genesis of Jesus Christ, literally a whole new creation. Now, which one of us would not be glad to hear a good news story of something new? Where there is no COVID-19 pandemic, no nuclear weapons, no sadness, no global warming, no grief, no innocent suffering, no international terrorism, no illegal migration or selfish introspection. That's precisely what Matthew does for us here. He gives us a record of the genealogy, the genesis of the one who would be born in order to undo the tragic influences and effects of the fall at the beginning, to bring about a whole new creation where the long-expected Messiah would reign in perfect holiness, justice, power, and love. So I wonder then, in these few moments that we have together, may you turn with me to this very passage which was doubtly read this morning with some bemusement from Matthew chapter 1. It's entitled, The Genealogy of Jesus, the Genesis in Greek, which can also mean birth or or origin. So here, according to Matthew, is the account of a whole new beginning for humanity— a new beginning for the world through this one man, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So can you see, first of all, the first 14 generations in verses 2 through to 6? It starts with Abraham, an old man to whom God gives an amazing promise at the commencement of his plan of salvation. Genesis 12 Verse 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. From this man Abram, as you know, came Isaac and Jacob, Boaz, Jesse, and a certain king called David. And so the next 14 generations, that's verses 6 through to 11, starts with King David, also known as the Lord's anointed. God also made a promise to him that his throne would be established forever 
And later he gave an amazing promise about a son who would come from David's line, who would be born in Bethlehem of Judea and would bring about peace and justice and a radical transformation on the whole world order. And then the final 14 generations, which you can see in verses 12 to 16. And this starts with the exile of the Hebrews to Babylon 587 years before Christ, when the Davidic dynasty of kings ended. However, after their return from exile, Jewish hopes grew that a son of David would arise, a future anointed one, Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek. And so we have this final list of 14 generations, and the whole of Matthew's genealogy reaches its apex in verse 16 with the birth to Mary of Jesus, the one who is called the Christ. And so while for us genealogies may not be the most exciting thing in all the earth, unless you happen to be Josh Whittacombe or Dame Judy Dench, which in Who Do You Think You Are recently found out that they were related to royalty and other bigwigs. This opening chapter of the gospel is actually making red-hot claims about Jesus to its first Jewish readers. Jesus The son of Abraham is the one through whom Abraham's blessing to all families on earth would be realized. Jesus, the son of David, is the hoped-for anointed Messiah who would transform the world. So here at last, after 42 generations, is the one we have been waiting for the fulfillment of God's huge promises to humankind. And so we read in verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. To an artisan's home, to a place the prophet Micah had foretold 800 years before it actually happened, in a place called Bethlehem, to be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, let me let you into another secret. The second piece of advice which professors Adley and Gibson would lightly give to would-be preachers is this. So what? What's the relevance of all this for the likes of you and for me sitting in church one week before Christmas, worried about my health concerned about my kids, anxious about my turkey. Why do I need to know about this genesis, this new beginning, this brand new start? Well, here's the big point. Can you see what an amazing, astonishing thing this is, that there is a purpose to this world? There is a plan that is being wonderfully worked out. And there is a person who is in charge of this creation. So let's think about that before we conclude. Ask the ordinary woman on the road or man in the street, what's the purpose of life? And they might reply something like this, Well, it actually might be interesting to ask that very question to a school friend or a colleague or or someone else that you know. What do you believe is the purpose of life? And don't be shocked if some reply, I haven't a clue. Or I've never really stopped to think about that question. For some people, of course, their purpose is closely connected to their vocation, to fulfilling, satisfying work, or for others, it is carrying out responsibilities to family and friends, and these are laudable things. But some will readily admit that for them, there really isn't 
a whole lot of purpose to life. It's random, they say. And since they believe that the world came into existence by accident, how could life itself have any more purpose than that? Than being born, being around for a number of years, dying, decaying to dust. Life for many is ultimately without meaning. But in these opening words of his gospel, Matthew tells a different story. Matthew articulates an alternative script. It is the way of faith, but not blind faith. Faith in the realities which are set before us in this at first glance boring genealogy. This world is not random. There is a purpose for this world. And down through the years, through the millennia, through generations, through history, this purpose is is little by little, yet inextricably step by step being worked out through Abram, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Tamar, through Rahab, through Ruth, to anointed king called David. And although there were times during Israel's history when God's people felt abandoned and shunted down some cul-de-sac and left there, yet this genealogy continued And to show that this life was not random, there is purpose to human existence. There is a plan that is being perfectly worked out for a person who made this world has now planned to redeem this world. And so we can see that down through the century, God has inexorably directed history towards this very moment. Chapter 1, verse 18 that Jesus, who is the Christ, the anointed one, the son of David, the son of Abram, would be born. And so, according to God's word, at precisely the right time, at exactly the right moment, Jesus was born in order to work for our good, to die the death we deserve, to rise again for our justification, to be with us by his Spirit, and to bring us home to be with him in a recreated creation forever and ever. Amen. And so, for anybody worshipping here today or watching online, who is worried about health or concerned about your kids or anxious about the turkey, Matthew chapter 1 is actually the very best news you could ever possibly hear. Life is not random. There's a purpose. Life is not without purpose. There is a plan for good. Life is not unplanned. God, who made us, continues to sustain us, and he is fulfilling his plan for this world by giving his son, the Lord Jesus, the son of Abram, the son of David, born of the Virgin Mary. Now, I'm nearly finished, but before I sign off, Can I give you a cool fact? Remember we said Matthew presents us here in his Gospel, chapter 1, with the genealogy of Jesus in three tranches of 14 generations, or that six batches of seven, the perfect number. So we have Abram, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and so on. We have that 14 times. And what's true for the first batch of names up to King David in verses 1 to 6 is also true for the second batch of names up to and including Josiah in the time of Israel's exile to Babylon. But in your own time, 
you might like to read the third paragraph, starting from verses 12 and ending in verse 16. And how many generations will you come across there? Fourteen? Well, actually, in this third section, there are just 13 names mentioned. Why? Because the third time, the 14th birth is of Jesus, whose father is God. Mary was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit, verse 18. And can I suggest that if God is in charge of history to that degree of perfection, you can be sure that nothing, no nothing, can ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.